Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Let's take our Bibles and turn there. And then uh, very quickly, I'm going to be reading uh, this because um, we're going to go to Revelation 10. And to me, Revelation 10 really, really nails down um, what I believe and why I believe that the, the resurrection of God's saints called the rapture, called uh, the Greek word is parousia, some some scholars, some writers, some churches, some pastors use that word parousia, being, which means being caught up, uh, the catching away, the translation, whatever word is you're happy with, um, to me, Revelation 10 nails it. Being at the tenth, or the, excuse me, the seventh trumpet, being at the sounding of the last trump, just like uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says. So let's get into the word now. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Um, and um, let's start in verse 1. We'll read down a little bit. Um, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you. Word. Now, this, this time, remember, a, a dispensation is God dispensed and gave Paul the gospel and, and told him to dispense it out. So when you have something that needs to be dispensed, you put it in a what? Dispensary. Okay? And you go to the dispensary to get what needs to be dispensed. And so that's what Paul was. He was a dispensary. And so if you have heard of the dispensation... Of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles, here it is, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Here we have another place that tells us that the mystery is related to God allowing or bringing the Gentiles into the kingdom of God, which before basically was restricted to the people, the physical, racial, genetic people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all right? And by the way, their seed, their bloodline, their DNA can still to this day be verified if a person claims they're a Jew and that, that can be verified. Uh, like I say, there are different groups who claim that they're the original Jews or that they're the only Jews. If you go down to Northwest Arkansas, that is the headquarters for the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan believes that only white, European, British, Caucasians are the true tribes of Israel. That's a lie. Because it basically says, it, it, it's their way of saying... God only lets us white British Caucasians into heaven. He doesn't save anybody else except us white British oriented uh, Caucasian people. Sounds like Hitler. An Aryan race is the only superior race and an Aryan race, a Germanic Aryan race, is going to be the one that rules the world. Well, not so much now. Okay. So anyway, um, the, the DNA of Jews is known. It, we know who they are. They have maintained their tribal identity throughout thousands of years in, in the form of now, in the form of many of their last names. Someone named Lo 
A Jew named Lo, L O W, like the guy that, like Lo's over here, the store. Okay? The other spelling of that is L E O W, which has the word Leo in it. It's the German version of Leo. And Leo is what tribe? Judah. Lion of the tribe of Judah. So they're fr they put their tribal identity into their last name. Cohen, Cohn, Le Le Levi, Levi, um, names like that. They are, Cohen is part of the tribe of Le Levi. Levi, Levi, different guys like that. They are Levites. Um, oh, who else? I can't remember how I used to have a list of how it was all broke down. But anyway, they've, they've maintained their tribal identity. There is no lost tribes of Israel. We know who they are. Okay. But anyway, now us Gentiles are brought into that with them. That was part of the mystery. God would not reveal that to the Jews back in the Old Testament. He's revealed it to us now that we can be part of them even though we don't keep the law, didn't keep the law, so on and so on, uh, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, verse 5, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, um, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace, um, uh, where did I go here? Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent now unto the the, unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So that and that part of it right there is instructing us that the mystery is known by the holy apostles, by the prophets, that the Gentiles are now fellow heirs with the Jew, with the believing Jews, um, and and that's important. But we can be part of the kingdom of God. We don't have to be tribes of Israel. We don't replace Israel. We're just added in there with them. All right. So um, we had worked at, we, we were looking at uh, Revelation chapter one and the mystery of the seven stars. Now I want us to go to Revelation 10 and I want you to open your Bibles there because this I, I did a study on it several years ago, and actually, I wrote a book on Revelation 10. Uh, and it had a limited publication. I've not released it to anybody in years. Uh, before I did, I think I would probably rewrite it. Not that I was majorly wrong about anything it's just that i just i don't know the way i write now and the way i wrote then somewhat different i'm a little bit more aged than i was in 2001 or 2002 <laughs> okay i have just a few more miles on me all right and um, that is in uh, Revelation 10, uh, I think it's down in verse 7, but we're going to work our way down to that, okay? And I'm going to try to do it uh, very quickly so that we see it. Um, but basically, when, when I really took in Revelation 10 and all that it was saying, and uh, when I got to verse 7... And uh, saw that there, I, I just really had settled it in my mind that the translation, the rapture, it is not what initiates every event in the book of Revelation, which is what a lot of people believe. Um, but 
it's it is I'll say it this way God does this and then he pours out his wrath on this earth and we're not a part of that God has not appointed us under wrath it to me there are a lot more scriptures that fit with this than what goes against it. Okay? I don't have to do as much twisting a scripture to make this work as I do just read it. All right? But anyway, let's look at, this is John now. John is writing this. John is describing what he's seeing. So, number one. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Okay? Another mighty angel. Is it, is it going to rain out there? Is it raining? Okay. Thank you, God, for the rain. Amen. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Now, I'm going to say this up front. I believe this mighty angel is Jesus. Okay, now, uh, some people would stop right there and say, uh, no, I'm sorry. Number one, we know that Jesus comes at the beginning of Revelation chapter 4, and that's it. Okay, and they, have no, um, they have no real evidence that he does. They just say that. I saw another, mighty, and they would say, well, see, that's an angel. And Jesus is not an angel. I beg to differ. He is in almost, and I can't prove it 100% of the time, but in almost every instance, when you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it's Jesus. And I'll give you one example, okay? I'll give you one example. Let me type that in here, and we're going to go to the book of Exodus. And I'm going to show you that the, the angel of the Lord is God. Exodus 3. Turn there, Exodus 3. Turn there, turn there, turn there. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, whose family found some oil and moved to Beverly Hills. Some of you will get that joke. And Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, which is Sinai, even to Horeb. Sinai had different names. Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. It seems like there was a third name for it, but anyway... And now notice this, notice the language now. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Now who's in the bush? S say it the way it says it, the angel of the Lord. We're going to build this case here. So you're a jury and I'm a lawyer and I'm going to bring this evidence to you. Who is in the midst of the bush? The angel of the Lord. Um, and he looked and behold the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. If, if Moses would have had a cell phone and TikTok and Facebook, he would have been streaming this live. Okay. So verse four, and when the Lord... Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Saw that he turned aside to see. God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. Who is in the midst of the bush? God. Who is the Lord? Who is the angel of the Lord? God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, 
I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon who? God. Now, verse 7 goes back to, see, in my opinion, this is the Bible's way of identifying all the way around so there's no misunderstanding who this is. He is the angel of the Lord. He is the Lord. He is God. And Moses was like Manoah, who was Samson's father. When the angel of the Lord appeared and he wanted to know his name, he said, why are you asking my name? See, it's a secret. And then poof, he's gone. And Manoah is like, uh, honey, we're going to die. Why? Because we just saw God. You can't see God and live. Okay? So, boom. They were like, we're going to die. But it was, that, was the, that was the Lord Jesus. Before he took the body of the little baby at Bethlehem. Um, and so he says, um, now verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So this is one example where the angel of the Lord is the Lord. Um, we have, let's see here, in Genesis. Um, Genesis 22, look up on the screen. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Who's me? The angel of the Lord. Who's the angel of the Lord? God, Jesus Christ. And in fact, let, let me just say it this way. I believe that every, um, every appearance of either the angel of the Lord or God, like in Genesis where it says, God walked in the cool of the evening in the Garden of Eden. Every sound that came from heaven, every time somebody said they heard God, and God said to them, I tend to believe that all of those were Jesus Christ. Now, I may be wrong. But God the Father um, is very distant from the world um, be because of man and because of sin. So I think all through the Old Testament, you have Jesus who is God who makes all these appearances, says all of these things to Moses, to Abraham, to David, to Solomon, uh, to the prophets, and so on, um, are Jesus or the Spirit of Christ. Uh, we know uh, from Second Peter that the men who wrote the Bible, the Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So it was the Holy Ghost, which is the Spirit of Christ, speaking to them. Uh, and that, that God the Father uh, remains distant from all of mankind until such a day in the creation of the new heaven and the new earth with us in a new body that we will now be able to hold the, behold the face of God and we can be with God the Father and not worry about being, worry about dying. Okay. And again, don't don't take that as an adamant dogma that I'm laying down to you. That if you don't believe it, you're just probably not going to heaven. That's just a theory of mine. All right. Huh? 
Take it with a grain of salt. That's right. And take it with a shaker of salt with me. Okay. All right. Now, so that's d different places where the angel of the Lord occurs. Now, there is um, references to the angel in, um, I think it's the book of Deuteronomy. Where God said, it's, oh, uh, ver, uh, Exodus, here it is, right here. Exodus 23, 20. Behold, I send an angel, capital A, before thee, to keep thee in the way, to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. And then verse 23. For mine angel, capital A, shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. So, we have those two verses there. With the angel as capital A, so the translators knew that that was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, referring to him as an angel. Exodus 34, or Exodus 32, 24, Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. And I think there may be one more occurrence where he's in all caps, or capital A. Genesis 48. Genesis 48. Thanks, smarty, smarty pants. Yeah, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, but bless the lads, okay? So, um, you have, definitely you have Christ as an angel. And, and here's one thing that you can be sure of, is that any office, any biblical spiritual office held by a man in the Bible, whether it's high priest, apostle, bishop, shepherd, angel, whatever, Christ is the chief of every one of those. He is the chief apostle. He is the preacher in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 with a capital P. So every one of us preachers are nothing. We're a stand-in for the chief of all preachers, Jesus Christ. He is the chief high priest of the order of Melchizedek. He is the great shepherd. He is the bishop, capital B, and he is the angel. He is the prophet. He is the judge. He is the creator. So any title belonging to spiritual things in the Bible, Jesus is the chief of every one of those. Okay, so we have an angel, a mighty angel coming down uh, from heaven. Um uh, when Jesus comes, what direction is he coming in? Down from heaven. Okay. So that's that part. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Okay. Number two, he's clothed with a cloud. Um, Matthew 24. Then shall they see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Behold, he's coming in. They shall see the Son of Man in the clouds. Matthew 24 says it twice. Revelation 1, Jesus himself said, Behold, I cometh with clouds. In Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascended up to heaven in a cloud, the two angels standing there said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has gone uh, up into heaven, shall so come again unto you in like manner. He left in a cloud. He's coming in a cloud. Here he is, clothed with a cloud. Number three, the rainbow was upon his head. Turn to Exodus. Uh, excuse me, Exodus. I get these two. God should have named Rexodus the, the one of them and Ezekiel the other. Or Exodus the first one and Rezekiel. That way I wouldn't get them mixed up anymore. Rezekiel 1. We have the Lord coming down in his chariot. And it says specifically here that... And I'm not down there yet. Um... There was the likeness of a throne in verse 26. And the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And 
Verse 28, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon it, fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. So the rainbow is the glory of the Lord in Exodus 16. The Bible says the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. Well, that was Christ appearing to the Jews uh, in a cloud. And, it, and in that chapter, he gave them manna. That was also the 66th chapter of the Bible. Okay. Um, Genesis 9. The very promise that that rain that's coming out there, that God's not going to let it rain for another 40 days and flood the entire earth again. The promise that he made for that, he gave us a token of it. A sign that, it, that he keep his promise. And the sign was, when I send the cloud over the land, you shall see the bow in the cloud. And the bow shall be the sign unto you that I will not flood the earth again. So who's the bow in the cloud in the day of rain? The glory of the Lord. Who's the glory of the Lord? Jesus Christ. He's coming in the clouds. And so right here it says, and a rainbow was upon his head. So that's Christ. That has to be deity. Because God said, I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not share with another. So if the rainbow, it's just rain. If the rainbow is the sign of the glory of the Lord, how could this rainbow be upon a lesser angel's head? When God said he would not share his glory with another. This is God. It has to be. Then it said his face was as it were the sun. Well, Matthew 17. Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. His face was shining as the sun. Malachi chapter 4. And then shall the sun, capital S-U-N, of righteousness, arise with healing in his wings. If you've ever seen the symbol of a sun with wings on it, it is a corruption of Christ who is the light of this world. Because generally, a solar, a winged solar disk, uh, that goes all the way back to ancient Egypt, that was applied to uh, Osiris, the sun god, uh, lots of other Mesopotamian or um, Asia Minor nations used the sun with wings symbol on it to signify their, their sun god. But what they're doing is they're stealing that from Christ. Okay, uh, And wh what is Christ doing with wings anyway? Well, remember, the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit appear? As a dove with wings okay so anyway because they're these three are one now so we have a mighty angel christ clothed with a cloud christ rainbows upon his head christ face as it were the sun when john saw jesus in chapter one of revelation said he turned and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength and in psalm 19 the Bible says the heavens declare the, the uh, handiwork of uh, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech. Night unto night showeth language. There's no speech nor voice where their voice. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Uh, in it, meaning the outer space, the heavens, he hath made a tabernacle for the sun, who runneth as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. The bridegroom is Christ. And he's the sun coming from east to west. Jesus said, as lightning shines from the east and goeth into the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And you go to, yes, sir. Isn't there a verse somewhere about um, Jesus having the golden face and his tongue and sword or something like that? Go to Revelation 1. In fact, I'll go to Revelation 1 for thee. You are smart. We like you. No, you're right. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Um, it would be in verse 
Um, verse 12, and I turned to see a vo the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, that's Christ, clothed with a garment down to the foot, is girt about the paps with a golden girdle. In other words, he just had a golden girdle here. His head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet were like unto fine brass. Remember that. As if they burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters, and his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. You're right. He gets it. What's wrong with you people? Anyway, back to Revelation 10. So sufficiently now, we have Christ. So far we have Christ. Now, his feet, this is my favorite part. His feet as pillars of fire. When John saw his feet in Revelation 1, remember what they said, what he said they were? Like brass is fire. Remember when the fiery serpents came in and bit everybody and God said, well, Moses, make a fiery serpent. And he made it out of brass. Brass is a symbol of fire. It's the same color as fire. So he has brazen feet. And... It says that his feet were as pillars of fire. Now, remember, one of those angel verses, in fact, several of those angel verses with the capital A that we saw in Exodus. Moses was telling everybody this angel, capital A, is going to lead you into that land. Now, in the Old Testament, when Israel went in there the first time, they were led by how many pillars of fire? One, because Jews only read the Old Testament. They won't read the New, they won't believe the New Testament. But it's all going to change now. Now he has both feet as pillars of fire. The Old and the New Testament. And Israel is going to follow the angel whose feet are like pillars of fire because they followed the pillars of fire into Canaan land in the Old Testament with one. So it was Jesus doing this. <laughs> Don't ask me to do it again. And now he's doing this. There's a verse, I think it's in Ecclesiastes, can two walk together except they be agreed, right? And of course, Jesus agrees with Jesus. He's Jesus. Now, uh, and to top it all off, the last time we saw Jesus that we know for sure was in Revelation 5 and 6. In Revelation 5, God had a book in his hand sealed with seven seals. The only one worthy to take the book and to loose the seals was the Lamb, Jesus. So in Revelation 6, he takes the book and he starts opening the seals. So the last time we see Jesus... And the book was in Jesus' hand and he was opening the seals. And he got all seven of them open. And now what do we see in verse 2? He had in his hand a little book open. Because he just opened it. And so now everything that has been sealed up to that time is now unsealed. And so, when he had his hand, a little book open, he set his right foot upon the sea. By the way, when Jesus was on this earth in his earthly ministry, did Jesus ever put his foot on the sea? Yeah. Hey, Peter, come here. Try this. He's walking on He's walking on water. He's walking on the sea. Be not afraid. Yeah, good one. So he puts his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the earth. Now we know that that right there shows dominion. Okay? So God told Joshua, every place the soles of your feet touch, that's what I'm giving you. 
So Christ now has taken dominion. This is my, this is my world now. I've, I've got the land and I've got the sea. Is there anything else? Nope. The land and the sea. So he has both of those. Verse 3, and he, and he cried with a loud voice as when a what roareth? A lion. And Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. That was, that was your time, God. Okay. Uttered their voices. And when the seventh, and the, the seventh, thunder is God's voice. On the day that God said publicly to everybody, this is my beloved son, people, thank you, some said it thundered. And if you look in the Old Testament, the Lord thundered with his voice. Okay? So this is God's voice. Seven thunders uttered their voices, so they spoke words. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Now, I, my theory is this, and I could be wrong, that they are already written in your Bible, the seven thunders. I don't know where they are. You don't know where they are. But here's one thing I know. John didn't write them. And John wrote the Gospel of John, the three letters of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and he wrote the book of Revelation. But in none of those did he write what those seven thunders uttered. But I do believe that they are written in the scriptures. And when everything is unsealed, I believe we'll know what they are. Um, now... How did I get to Revelation 11? Um, back to Revelation 10, where we belong. I'm getting to one point here. So this is Jesus. Um, in verse 5. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created the heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things. That, this, this is what we do. They still do it in courts of law, even though they may not use a Bible in some places. They still say, raise your right hand. Why do we do that? Why don't we go something like this? Okay, join your fingers like this. Now, repeat after me. Uh, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Why don't we do that? Why do we do this? Where did this come from? Right here. Swear by him. Lifted up his hand to heaven. And the earth and things that are there that therein are in the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Now he does not he's not saying time's done. Time's up, it's over with, there's no more time, because we know there's gonna be at least a thousand years after this. What it means is the time that God is gonna bring about. The things that he promised, that time is up. And so now, there should be time no longer. Now we're going to blow that seventh trumpet. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, which would be the seventh and last trumpet, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. What is the mystery of God? We go back to Romans. Beloved, I would not have you ignorant of this one thing, that blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So mystery number one being over with is now Israel's eyes are going to be opened. Mystery number two. Every Gentile that's going to be saved is now saved. The fullness of the Gentiles has come. No more room for Gentiles. We're done. Uh, mystery number three. 
uh, the Gentiles are fellow heirs with the Jews and the part of God's kingdom. Mystery number four. I'm just just varyingly numbering these. Mystery number four. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Boom. Those two vo verses are clamped together by God. The mystery of God is going to be finished. Everything that God swore, that God promised, that he had hid, is now going to take place. The mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And everything that pertains to that, completed. The mystery of iniquity, which is the revelation of who the Antichrist is, what he looks like, and everything about him, that mystery of iniquity is also going to be revealed on that day. There's going to be a falling away first, and then that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. This is the mystery of iniquity. So basically, everything that we have read that is part of the mystery of God is now complete. It's all revealed. None of it's going to be a secret to anybody anymore. God is even going to let the church tell all of the devils what it is. And the devils are going to go, What? And we're going to say, <laughs> We knew this a long time ago. It's a shame you didn't. Something like that. I'm sarcastic, so I think we're all going to be sarcastic on that day. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel... Now, here's something interesting, and then we'll go on this. When he shall begin to sound, apparently he doesn't just go, doo -doo -doo, and it's over with. Maybe when the angel begins to sound, there is an expanse of time. We don't know how long that angel sounds. We know that the, the sounding of the trumpet at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, not only was the trumpet exceeding loud, but it was long. Okay? It took a while for that sound to stop. We don't know how long it takes for this seventh angel and his voice to sound. And the reason why I say that is, if you look at Revelation 11, the very next chapter, you have again a mentioning of the seventh trumpet sounding. Uh, in um, verse... 15, and the seventh angel sounded. Okay. Well, I thought he sounded in chapter 10. He sounded here. The seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Uh, I, and I, I do see a connection between this and his foot being on the sea and his foot being on the earth. In other words, I'm, I'm taking over. I'm taking over all the dominions. I'm taking over all the kingdoms. All you uh, principality devils, you're done. Okay? You're done ruling over the cities of this earth, the families of this earth, the people of this earth. You're done ruling over them. I'm taking over. You bring your armies and you fight with me, but I promise you, you're going to lose. And you're going to lose bad. Okay, so anyway, that's that's what I think happens to me that that mystery of God being finished in Revelation 10 nailed it for me because it was at the beginning of the sounding of the very last trumpet. And that is exactly what Paul said in first Corinthians 15. What did you find? Yeah.
That's interesting. Some said that that was proof there was no women in heaven. Because it was silent in heaven for half an hour and there's never a chance women can be silent for half an hour. I don't believe that. Just for everybody who's here. All right, let's stand to our feet.